Good morning, everyone. My name is Steve Bader, and I'm the Associate Director of Open Source Applications at D the Distance Educa Digital Education Learning Technology Applications at NC State. We like to call ourselves Delta for short, because that's pretty long. I started with Delta 10 years ago when we, Delta needed help upgrading from 1.9 to 2.3, which was a big jump. And every year since then, we've upgraded Moodle with our upgrade process, which we've worked on. Uh, during my tenure, I've had the privilege of working on the local course copier, which copies courses across instances of Moodle, a web services that, that push uh, student grades into our student information service, and several plugins around gamification within the course and the event system. As a part of a grant, recently I've gotten to program the Moodle course roadmap, which there's a poster presentation on tomorrow. Uh, recently, we've adopted the Mod Zoom plugin, and my team is the maintainer on that, and we've been pretty excited about that. All in all, I'm a pretty big fan of Moodle. So I'm here to present to you the guide that we use to upgrade Moodle. Uh, it's a refined process that changes every year because we usually get, a th get thrown a curveball of some type, and it either proves that we need this type of process or that we need to add more, more to our process. Um, this year we learned that there were millions of questions in our, ta in our questions table that were growing out of hand. They were random questions. Um, so now we look for crazy growth in our question table. So starting with our timeline, um, we begin our process around the end of September, and we start it with a very important planning process. And then we get, when, when we get our hands on Moodle in the November release, we'll start making it our own. So we'll add plugins, we'll add our, our, uh, our commits, and we will add outside plugins from other vendors and our core modifications. And if the train's running on time at the turn of the year, we'll look at config, uh, the new settings, the removed settings, we'll look at capabilities, uh, the ones that have been added and removed. And sometime in January, we'll get our first version set up for our, our department to start looking at and creating support materials. Uh, hopefully, by the end of February, we'll have a working system ready to go, and we'll stand it up. Our, we'll, we stand up one instance of Moodle, a fresh instance, and then after that, we work on an upgrade for our two perpetual servers. And we'll practice that from February to May. So we're going to look at the details of this, of this plan a little bit. And the first step that we're going to take is selecting the version. Um, our, our plan is built around that November release uh, because we don't like to ride the wave of a new release. So we won't immediately grab the latest and greatest and put it into our production systems. We'll grab this November release and we'll put it into production sometime in March. That gives us time, that gives the community time, that gives the tracker time to find those bugs, uh, which we're happy to help with, but we don't want to find them in production or have our instructors encounter them. Um, we also like to respect the supported date range. So the security date range is very important to us. Uh, so we ought to make sure the lifespan of that matches, the, matches or exceeds the lifespan of our production server within the year. And then finally, we're going to look at new features. Um, new features since our last install. So our previous install was 3.9. We'll look at 3.10, 3.11, and 4.0, and we'll look at the features within Moodle. Um, a lot of times that we find, too many changes is actually a negative thing for our uh, faculty and students. So we kind of we kind of trying to find that, that great balance. Um, this year we really tested them with the 4.0 release, um, with all the interface changes. We had we had some folks that had some struggles. Um, after we decide on our version, we're going to go to the infrastructure. We're going to make sure that our PHP version and whatever database version we're using is going to be up to date and its life cycle is good with ours. Um, we chose PHP 8. Uh, we did not go to 8.0, just or 8.1, because it's it's a it's a very new release, and we've got to respect all the vendors that we rely on and make sure that they support the current PHP version. Um, we couldn't stay on 7.4 because 7.4's lifespan is going to run up this year, and we wanted to make sure we were supported for the full life cycle. So we chose 8. Um, we did have some struggles getting um, some of our vendors, some of our plugins, making sure that their, their code was ready for eight. 
The, the big issue there was the ordering of parameters within functions, your optional parameters had to go last. So we note all these changes and we, we, we document them as we prepare for our upgrade. Hello. There we go. Next we're gonna look at the important code modifications that Moodle has made. And the best place to go to start with is the uh, Moodle documentation. They got a very nice new website at moodledev.io. Um, we're gonna go and we're gonna look at that 310 release, that 311 release, and the 4.0. Uh, we're gonna look at the major tracker items that are listed. And if you get into that tracker, you can, you can filter that tracker by release. So you'll find not just the major, but the minor tracker items. And sometimes the minor is major to you. Um, but there's also a section to play close attention to. It's called the for developer section. Um, it'll list out the core plugins that were re removed in Moodle. It'll list out the deprecations, which are important to your code. Make sure that you, you're also removing them in your code. And it's also gonna list out component APIs that were upgraded. If those are important to you, you wanna make sure that you pay close attention when you revisit your code. So we're noting all these for later. Also, I like to look in the lib, deprecated lib PHP. It gives you kind of the history, it also gives you a little look into the future of deprecations, um, things that are gonna start throwing warnings as opposed to errors, you'll see that coming and you can kind of prepare for that coming down the line. Uh, also, libdb upgrade is a great place to look for a running history of the database changes. So you can see the way the database is changing in the current version. And some things you won't find in the tracker that you say, why are they doing that? So we'll look there as well. There we go. And then finally, we're gonna review last year's data. So we're gonna go into our current database, we're gonna look at activities, and we're going to look at the usage there. We want to see that, just got weird. Um, we wanna see how much our instructors are using, what they're not using. Um, and we wanna decide, you know, maybe it's time that a, pl a plugin retires because it's not being used or it's not, be it's not worth our time for maintaining it. Oops, sorry. All right. That will lead us up to the November release, and we will get into our development review. Uh, the first step in our development review is getting a place to work. We will get our dev and test servers set up. Our dev server is a place that all of our developers can spin up their own instance of Moodle. They can tear it back down and spin up another one. Uh, we like to test our plugins or our com commits in a clean environment so that there's no cross-contamination between what we're testing. Um, and we're gonna go through all of our plugins, our commits and stuff there. Uh, and then we'll have a test environment that our larger department has access to. So that's where they're gonna build their support materials and test for us. Uh, it's fun to note that we have two protected branches that we maintain. One's the test 4.0 branch, where our developers will create pull requests and we'll approve them. And then there's the main 4.0 branch, which I integrate the approved changes into um, our main repository. Uh, it's something to note this year, there were so many changes visually in Moodle 4.0 that we set up a Moodle preview server. It's a production-like server. We set it up early and we allowed anybody on campus to opt in so that they could see those changes and kind of get rid of that shock that we're gonna see when they saw the changes in Moodle. So next we're gonna do the tedious core commit walkthrough. We have about 100 commits that we make to Moodle. It's core changes. Um, they're not necessarily bug fixes because we try really hard to give that back to Moodle, but these are behavior alterifications that work better for us at the university. And we'll walk through each one of those commits instead of just doing a flat rebase and hoping it's all gonna work. We go through and make sure that the change is still needed, that there are, there are no new conflicts because of the code changes from Moodle and we'll make sure that the patch still works as desired. Um, we are also working really hard to get our own set of Bahat and PHP unit tests for these commits so that this step isn't as tedious in the future. Next, we'll look at the plugins that we maintain. So the course copier that I mentioned before, the course roadmap, our gamification plugins, um, and we have some plugins that we've adopted because the original maintainer kind of flew the coop and we needed to take over because our instructors didn't want to see that plugin go away. Um, we will look at the updated component APIs that we mentioned before, look into those um, 
the, into those plugins and make sure that everything's up to date there. We'll make sure PHP 8 works for it. Uh, and we'll also look over the interface because Moodle has changed so much, we don't want the plugin to look out of place. So we will update the um, UX UI in that as well. Um, and that was a significant process this year. Then we're gonna do our community and vendor plugin audit. You would like to think that when you get a plugin from a vendor that it's gonna install and you're not gonna have any issues, there's no bugs or anything, but it's, it's, it's rarely the case. Um, a lot of times we have to give some code back to them, we have to test it for them. Um, there's a lot of PHP 8 that wasn't ready in our vendor plugins. Uh, so we go through the same steps we do with our own, but we also do a health of plugin check with our vendors or, or with our third party plugins. We'll see, we'll go to the repository, see if there's a community still alive and around that plugin. We'll see if it's well maintained or if it's gone stagnant, uh, which is kind of a warning sign. And we'll see that if, if there's any issues being reported and if are, are those issues being fixed. And if the health of this plugin is not well, is it one that we adopt and start maintaining if it's something worth our time for the instructors looking at those usage numbers or is it something that we can finally let go? Hello, there we go. So now we get our, we have our code base pretty well intact. We've got our commit review done. We've got our plugins installed. We probably have some loose hanging ends, but we can, we're moving into the start of the new year and we want to start looking at our uh, config setting changes and our capability setting changes. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to extract those changes. So uh, years ago, I developed a script that goes in and pulls out the um, site level settings and the plugin settings and then some settings from other areas in Moodle and I put them into a data file. And then we'll run that on the, our old version, we'll run that on our new version, and with a secondary script, we'll find out the differences. So we get a full list of new settings, a full list of uh, settings that were removed, maybe because we deleted a plugin, and then a very small list of settings that had their defaults changed, which was a little hocus pocus we ran into years ago when we thought we, our settings were right, but because the default changed, we kind of got uh, bamboozled. Um, where am I? Yeah, so we'll pull those out. One thing I would want to mention that was really cool this year, when we, we upgraded using the CLI command in 4.0, um, Moodle did this really cool thing and it spat out all the new settings. So it's starting to do what I've been doing by hand. So I thought that was really nice of them. Then we're gonna do the same thing with our capabilities, except we have a local plugin that's on our repository. It's in public view. Um, this local plugin will pull out capabilities, both roles and capabilities in the system and how they're set, and it'll push it out to an XML file. We originally created this plugin so that we can grab that XML file and sync all of our instances so they were identical. That way no one, you know, one instance got really weird or anything. They were all the same. Well, I take those XML files for the old and new, and I compare those as well. So we have the new capabilities with the new instance of Moodle, the change capabilities uh, and the ones that were removed. We'll take all of those, both uh, config settings and capabilities to our tactical committee, their governance, and let them decide how do you guys want this set. And when they decide how they want it set, I put it into our config script that runs against the server and sets everything the way we want. We've got some LTI considerations. If you're just upgrading your server, it's not so bad because your course IDs are the same, your user IDs are the same, the configurations stay in place, so the LTIs are kind of still set to go. Uh, but if you're standing up a new instance like we do every year, and we're moving our population into that new instance every year, we kind of run into some issues with those course IDs restarting, and the user IDs getting jumbled because of um, them loading in differently. Um, my advice here is to approach the vendor, um, tell them your scenario, and have them handle it on their end. Because we're going to set up that configuration, we're gonna to connect to them, we need them to know what our issue is. Uh, fortunately, most vendors have some type of solution, whether it's pause the server, sever the data, and start us over, or give us a new configuration detail, whatever it may be, 
be upfront with them and let them know and work with them. Um, my biggest advice is whenever you set up an LTI, contact that vendor and say, hey, I want to walk through this with you. I want you to look at my config settings. And I want you to show me, you know, set us up an instance live real, fit, real fast, either on test and, and or production. And most vendors are completely open and happy to do so because they want to avoid issue as well. Um, and that's been very successful for us. One thing to note, whether you're upgrading or you start new instances every year, um, there is a move from 1.1 to 1.3 LTI. And if you're on 1.1, most vendors go into 1.3, you're going to have that little hiccup where the instructor backs up their course. It's going to have that 1.1 LTI in it. They're going to restore it. It's going to have that 1.1 LTI in it. You're going to need them to move over to the 1.3 configuration. Um, and there's, there's not really a way to avoid that, that I know of. There we go. So finally, we test our integrations. We've got that course. Um, we have course creation automation. We have user enrollment scripts. We have grade extraction. We have the process of backupping and restoring. Um, when we get that into test, we test that with our, our unit tests. So we have a test that we can run against that test server and go through all the functionality for each of those and make sure they work uh, because testing in production isn't that great. So that's our last step, make sure all integrations are working. After that, we can set up our new installation of Moodle. So we stand up our new, new installation during our spring break. It will go live in the summer, but we let allows our instructors to get on board and get in. But if you're upgrading your Moodle server, there's a few more steps I want to mention. For us, when we practice our upgrades, we go ahead and take a snapshot of production and we put it on a replica server. And we, we change uh, config values like divert all emails to an address so that you know, the this, this server doesn't send out emails to anybody. And we, we run the URL replace tool against the server to take it from the pr production URL to the staging URL, to that repl replica URL. Once we get our replica set up so that it's running on its own and it's identical to production, we'll take a snapshot of its database and we'll take a snapshot of its Moodle data folder and we'll set those aside. And now we can run a practice upgrade. If things go wrong or we don't like it, we restore that snapshot and we can run it again. So we can run it over and over until we're really happy with the output. Um, a lot of times there's, there's plugins in the background that don't like going through the upgrade process. They may spit out some errors. Um, and we want to make sure that you know, we're, we're getting through those uh, and working out to get a smooth upgrade. Sorry, I skipped. Um, so the important thing here is if you're removing plugins, remove them before you upgrade. Um, that way it doesn't have to go through that upgrade process. Uh, just make sure that you know that when you remove that plugin, you're going to remove the data with that plugin too, because that, that plugin is going to take away the tables, and along with the tables goes the data for that plugin. Um, one thing that we had to do a few years back, we moved from form ng to Moodle Core's new forum um, because we really liked it and Form NG wasn't, wasn't right for us anymore. Uh, so this was the step that we had to create a script that moved that data from one plugin into Core. So we had a little conversion script and um, we got that moved in. Uh, da -da. One thing to mention on our code base, the way we um, have it in Git, our Git repository, our, our main Moodle core is one repository, and then we have uh, roughly 40 submodules that are a part of that uh, repository. Each one of those submodules represents one of our plugins that's managed in its own repository. So if we have changes and we do pull requests against it, those happen in those repositories. And then I, as the maintainer, manage the main branch and which one the, that main branch is looking at. Hello? Uh, my advice, I always upgrade via CLI. You get the output, you get all the output. Um, you don't have to worry about any browser um, confusion or caching, uh, which Moodle's still really good about, but I, I, trust, I trust the terminal more than anything. Um, I like piping the output so that I can review it later. You know, if something crashes and it, and it dumps a whole bunch of stuff out, I can dig through it. Um, so that small bit of advice there, making sure debugging's on. What am I supposed to point this at? And then 
post-launch. Um, a few things here. After you've launched, uh, my best advice is be available, almost. Um, so block off some time, be ready to respond fast. This is your first impression. As soon as that server goes up, an instructor has formed an opinion. So if, if there's something going wrong, uh, jump on it as quick as you can. Uh, be responsive. Engage with the Moodle community. Uh, it's so important that if you run into errors or confusion, report it on the tracker. Even if it is confusion, if a lot of people are having the same confusion, it's probably actually a problem. Um, the tracker is open to anybody, not just developers. Actually, we probably need more non-developers, uh, more end users, uh, supplying your opinions on what our direction should be. Uh, help us write test cases. If you know how it should work, write those steps out. If you, if you know how, it sh how it's not working and how it's busted, write those steps out. Um, and if you have code, of course, uh, help us out by tossing it up there. And then my last piece of advice is to actively monitor. Um, we use, you know, look into those error, server error logs, just take a glance. You'll see stuff in there. You'll uh, watch database growth is our advice this year. Um, our questions table started growing way out of hand really fast, and it was a sign that there was something wrong. And server in infrastructure monitoring, we use a program called Nagios. Just tell tell signs that we can, we can identify an issue before someone else does. Um, I hope something in there was helpful for you to today, and that's all I have. So we have a few minutes for questions. Does anybody have any? Also, if there's a, if there are any empty seats, could somebody like stand up and point to if there's a place available? I don't know if there's empty chairs anywhere, but yeah, go ahead. Um, development processes, your configurations, reviews. Um, do you implement any automation to your to your stages? So we're, we're playing around with it. I, I think we're a little behind in that department, and that might be my fault because I'm, I'm a hands-on guy. Okay. Um, I really like that idea, um, but we, we're working more of that on the production side and not on the, the development side. Okay. So um, I, after I, as a maintainer, get those pushed up, um, we're getting to where production will start updating itself um, more automated. But on the developer side, we're still old school, I guess. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Just a quick question. How many people are responsible for doing all this work, and do you think that number is adequate? Are you happy with that? So, developers, there's four of us. Um, however, the whole Moodle upgrade process, uh, we have we have an all-in department that, that, that works on it, um, and that, that is all of Delta. Um, there's a presentation tomorrow, I think it is, that is the Moodle 4 upgrade on the whole that encompasses our entire department. So the support materials, the ID team, the instru uh, instructional development team, um, the design team. So there, there is a lot more than just us developers, but this is more of a technical thing. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you talked about uh, your code base in Git and adding plugins as sub-plugins. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess you're doing that instead of sub-modules. Um, how are you handling plugins that have sub-plugins themselves? So that works. Um, I think H5P has sub-plugins as well, and you can run a recursive command that pulls them. Um, we don't actually maintain their sub-plugins, but we do keep a copy of the plugins repository in ours, um, because a lot of our plugins, we have commits on top of theirs. Um, we we give ourselves the right to change anything um, in, in our install. So we, we've, we have some modifications to plugins that we bring in as well. Thank you. Uh, do, do you have to handle also integration with uh, the public clouds uh, like uh, Google, Google Classroom or Office 365 for Education, similar thing? So our campus is a Google campus. Um, but we don't use Google Classroom. Okay. Um, but we do use uh, 
file embed and the repositories, and we connect those. Okay. Yeah. So, the, the, so the integration is just the sharing at the Google Drive level? Yeah. And yeah. so forth? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Nope. Up here. Um, I guess that's a little bit out of out of touch with the update process, but I have a question about the copy processing. Um, since I work with the copy process, I would like to ask if there's any planning on simplifying the copy process. So, um, Moodle Core's process is, as far as code goes, is not simple. Um, it, it, it's rather involved, but it makes it easy for the end user. Um, we simplified it by uh, a, another program that we run is called Wolfware. It's, it's our portal to our, 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 our university. And the instructor can go in there and say, I want to copy this course to this course. And our, our code does all the work. So it'll run the backup on one server. It'll, it'll pull it down into a shared, uh, shared server, and then it will restore it on, the, on another server for them because we wanted it to be easier. Um, but I don't know if Moodle is going to make it any simpler. You said that, that um, you said that when you test the new release, you get the learners to have a sneak peek at the new version. Uh, for example, version four. Yeah. Uh, how does you handle that? Do they sign up to a forum? Do they just get the URL, or do they create a new user, or uh, how do you handle that? So we're also a Shibboleth campus, um, so we run a Shibboleth plugin. So if if a user um, hits our site, the Shibboleth will uh, it'll push them out, they'll log in, and it'll create a user on the fly. Uh, so we didn't have to worry about the create user, but we did set up a form that if they wanted to try Moodle in the Moodle preview server, uh, if they filled out the form and agreed to the beta version of our Moodle, then it would, it would build them a course and add them as an instructor. Uh, so yeah, we automated a little bit there. <laughs> 